morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining me today, whatever time it is, wherever you're watching this. So for this, I'll be sharing a story with you about something my company did that a lot of people are looking into, which was to begin using continuous integration, continuous deployment, and continuous delivery of code. And there's a lot of stuff on the internet. And a lot of it starts with, so set up your new solution, which is great if you have a new solution, but not so great if you're working with existing code. So this is a story of one way you can move in that direction with your existing code. My name is Lorian Rensing, and I am a software developer. You can find me on GitHub and occasionally even on Twitter when I actually look at that account. So when we started, it was nothing like all of those very clear and helpful articles you find that tell you to start a new solution and set it up in Docker containers and then use Jenkins to manage your pipeline. Now, we started with a monolith. We had a lot of code, some of it very old, some of it not as old, and all of it very intertwined with each other. We had a lot of solutions. Now on the bright side, the solutions themselves were grouped by the area of business. But then we had a single sign-on project that handled the access control for all of our web projects that needed a login. So all of those projects in IIS had to live underneath the SSO site. But then we had web projects that did not require a login, and so they had their own sites in, S in IIS, which requires a lot of configuration to keep everything behaving properly. And then we had additional solutions for non-web services. We had some Windows services, we had some click once applications, but in general, our structure looked something like this, where everything shared some common low level projects. So these low level projects shared a lot of things. They contained our object models. They contained some very helpful enums. They contained some common ASPX controls that we used in our web forms. They contained some custom exceptions. They contained a lot of utilities. They contained all of our data access code and they contained our business logic. And having all of these in shared projects led to some issues. Because this was common code, if you changed it in one solution, it would change it in every solution. And that meant that you had to test every solution and you had to deploy every solution. And rather than spend the time trying to figure out exactly where this common code might be used across multiple solutions, people got in the habit of just writing a new method rather than updating an old method. And the result was our monolith got even bigger. The other result was that solutions that nobody had worked in ended up having to be deployed to production and that having to be smoke tested. And then there was our database. It was designed to be highly extensible for future business opportunities, which sounds great. And it was third normal form, which also sounds great. Absolutely textbook. Unless, of course, you consider that the textbook in question would probably be about the size of the unabridged Oxford English Dictionary. I've seen the unabridged Oxford English Dictionary. It's something like six feet long. And then there's the fact that there really wasn't any source control for the database. We had some SSIS packages for make, moving commonly made changes between environments, but those didn't help much with one-off changes or handling any updates if new things needed to be commonly moved. And this highly normalized structure had its own problems. First, we've got 
a sheer quantity of data. So not only are there a lot of records, but those records are split across multiple normalized tables. And this can really obscure how that data is being used. For instance, it takes four tables to store a single image. And that doesn't include any type tables that we're using for common reference values. And there weren't really any automated methods to communicate if we were making changes to the database and needed to say, update the, I the SSIS packages or run some one-off scripts when we were deploying our code. We were using Team Foundation Services or Microsoft TFS as both our source control and our build server, which was good because since we are a Microsoft shop, it worked very well with Visual Studio and could easily deploy code to our development, test, and production environments. And it had its issues as well. It really didn't have any safeguards to prevent unwrite unbuildable code from getting checked in. It was very easy to overwrite someone else's code. And if you merged code for a project that wasn't finished yet, you had the risk of deploying that code to production. And of course, we could then deploy that code in multiple ways as well. We could use the publish commands in Visual Studio. We could use command line scripts. But there was no central way of tracking what code was currently on one environment. And that led to confusion with our QA department, who weren't always sure what code is ready to test. Then there was the deployment process itself. It was a very manual process. Every two weeks, early in the morning, to avoid disrupting our customers' business day. Many of them were located further west of us and worked late into the evening. so an early morning time ended up being the least disruptive. Unless, of course, you were the one waking up at five in the morning for the deployment. We had PowerShell scripts that would archive previous versions of the code and build a new version of code, and then copy the new code to a new version of our Amazon machine instance that we referred to as ProdWeb Gold. Then we would manually update the database with any changes that we needed to make for the latest code. And we were at least able to take advantage of some of Amazon's tools for cloud hosting. So we could increase the number of web servers that we had running. These would spin up from our latest version of our gold AMI. Once they were fully up, we would decrease back to our original number and they would spin down the servers running the old code, take them offline. And at that point, we could begin our manual smoke testing. And it was all manual. Not just in production, but really in any of our environments. We had no easy source of truth for what code was live on what environment. QA wasn't always sure what projects were ready to test or what parts of what project, which means that sometimes we would get bug reports on new code of something and have to return them saying, well, yes, you're right. It's not working because I haven't written it yet. We also had to have a, what we called a code freeze just to make sure that everything that was being deployed to production really did work without putting yet more code out that would need to be tested before it could be deployed to production. There was also the problem that code for a partially completed feature couldn't be merged, lest the incomplete, incomplete changes went to production. So projects couldn't be tested until they were completely finished. And then, as I mentioned earlier, if any of this required change to a shared project, we had to regression test every solution using that project. We needed a new plan.
we started looking at what it would take to do some continuous integration with our code. So for this, we would have a repository where the developers could check out the code. They would do development on their local computers, issue a pull request. The build server would then attempt to build the code. And until that code had been built and any unit tests had passed, we couldn't merge. After everything built and after all of the unit tests passed, we could merge the code back into the repository. And so whenever a developer began the cycle again, checking out the code, it would always be code that we knew would at least compile and build. So the next step after continuous integration was continuous delivery. So continuous integration ensures that our code is in a releasable state. So it won't immediately break production, it has compiled. And this means that we can release the code when it's ready rather than waiting for a fixed calendar date. We would usually push on Tuesday mornings, but if the code happened to be ready on the Thursday before that, we still had to wait. With continuous delivery, the code could go to our main build server and then be ready to deploy to the web servers at the time that was most convenient. Continuous deployment is the step beyond that, where every time something gets built on a production build server, it immediately gets deployed to the web server. And this process continues every time you have changes. So to do this, we needed some new tools. And we settled on a build server called TeamCity, and we started using GitHub for our code repository. We also needed a new structure for our solution. In our old projects, we were using ASPX web forms, which were certainly great when they were the new thing, but they hadn't been the new thing for a long time. We were using nHibernate for our data access, which again, when it was new, was great, and it wasn't new anymore. We made a lot of direct calls to our services, which meant that unit testing was very difficult due to the direct dependencies. And the net result of that was all of our testing was done manually. In our new projects, we created them as single page applications with JavaScript front ends using API controllers to talk to our back end. We replaced and hibernate with entity framework for our data access. We began using dependency injection to reference our services which meant that suddenly unit tests became not only a viable thing to have, but practically a required part of our project. We started using GitHub for our source control. This let us have separate branches for each developer to work against. And then as described in the continuous integration slide, we would use a pull request to merge the code back into the main branch. We also required a different developer to review our code prior to the merge being permitted. And we required the code to build prior to merging. So this helped ensure that our code met minimum standards of quality before being merged back into that main branch. We were using Team City then for continuous integration. Unit testing became a standard part of the development process. And Team City was able to create build steps for us. One of those build steps that we used was to require any unit tests to run and pass before a build was considered to succeed. So even if your code compiled, if your tests failed, the build would not actually pass. And then all those shared projects became NuGet packages. 
They were extracted to their own GitHub repository, and then each sh individual shared project became its own individual NuGet package. This meant that each solution only needed to have the NuGet packages that it was actually using rather than everything shared. And it only needed to get the updates when it needed changes rather than whenever anything needed to be changed. So this gave us quite a lot of improvements. Team City left us with a web page interface so developers could see what code had been deployed and when it was last deployed. Adding unit tests gave us more confidence in the quality of our code. The automatic build and deployment jobs that we could run from Team City began to replace the PowerShell scripts that had to be updated for each new version of the code. And we started adding descriptive database schemas to describe what each table was being used for. So we were well positioned to move to a continuous delivery model, which gave us a lot more flexibility in our deployment schedule. This is really useful when things aren't happening according to a strict schedule, for example, a one-off holiday, or people are going on vacation. Now we could move our deployment dates around those instead of having to fight with the calendar. There were still some issues, of course. We didn't change all of our projects at once, so those untested web forms projects were still hanging out there. All of our regression testing was still being done manually. We didn't really have a good strategy either for balancing long-term projects like new feature development with short-term projects like small upgrades and bug fixes. And a single branch of a solution could very possibly have code for both of these. We also needed clarity on what our test environment was being used for. Did this hold code that was ready to be tested? Or was this code that had been tested and was a release candidate for production? And that large and highly normalized database? Well, even with our new schemas, it was still a large and highly normalized database. So we needed to move forward. One of the things we did was to give a lot of control over this to our QA department. We created some new build scripts that would allow QA to move code to the test environment. This did require a strict naming convention, but it was also a very straightforward naming convention. In this case, the branch name had to be prefixed with test, and then it would contain a release number. And the release number was simply the year followed by a dot and whatever release the code was going to be pushed in. We also created a dedicated Slack channel for discussing these releases. And the topic for this channel would be updated to match the current branch of code that was on our test environment. QA also began automating their regression tests, initially with Selenium and some newer ones with Nightwatch. The Selenium tests still have to be triggered manually on some dedicated virtual machines that QA uses. And the Nightwatch tests can actually run on our build server, thus allowing them to be part of those build steps as well. So another level of quality that has to be enforced before code can be merged. We also started doing continuous deployment to our development environment. So we would write code, make a pull request, merge the code, and then the code would be deployed. This meant our development environment always had the absolute latest code, which meant that the developers could quickly verify their code worked on a real server and not just their local computer. This was particularly valuable for things such as sending an email or receiving a callback 
from an external service. And QA could very easily look at code that was not yet in the queue for release. We also started putting feature toggles around everything. Every new feature got wrapped in a toggle. We created an internal tool that let us easily control and view what state any given toggle was in. Now it was safe for incomplete code to be pushed. So we could have long running changes be on the same solution as short bug fixes and small improvements. Our single monolithic database became databases for everyone. Each new project or feature got its own database created. And these databases only contain data relevant to the business need for that project. We made some changes to our deployment as well. We began versioning the gold AMIs that we were using. Instead of overwriting our previous AMI as part of the deployment, we would create a new version of the AMI and leave the old version as the gold copy until it was time to deploy new code. This meant that the pre-work for the deployment could be done at any point after we had determined that the code on our test environment was good and ready to be deployed. Now it only takes 15 minutes and sometimes less to deploy the new code to production. And this gives us an option to release the code midday. Plus with our toggles, we're able to decouple code release from feature release. Not only do features no longer have to be released on, a, uh, on the same day they're deployed, we don't actually have to deploy any code on the day that we are releasing a feature, which gives us a lot of flexibility in coordinating with our communications and training department about our new features. So we're doing better, but there's still some issues. If QA finds a major bug, it's very difficult to do this on the test branch since our usual pipeline involves pushing code to test or involves pushing code to a development branch, which QA would then create their test branch from. But the bug fixes had to be done directly on that test branch. The toggles that we like so much had to be manually added and removed from the database. And there wasn't really a standard process for removing these toggles. Our original database is still very large and still in heavy use. And with all these new databases, we've got some duplicate data across them. They're less normalized, so they're easier to read, but there is the duplication. And there's really no automation in moving data across these different databases. So how did we do this? The first thing in implementing a transition like this is to have a goal. And in our case, our goal wasn't actually to start using a CI CD process. Instead, it was a tool that we used to reach other goals. And those goals were to improve software quality, which would give a better experience to our customers. We wanted to make our deployments more often, and we wanted to make our deployments easier. We took heavy advantage of some outside consultants to set this up. These consultants were able to recommend tools that would work with our system. And they were able to help us set up those tools and advise us on what the current best practices were rather than stumbling around trying to figure this stuff out ourselves. 
we set up a lot of standards and processes. We wanted to do things the same way every time. We documented the process so we knew what that same way was. And we took advantage of the fact that computers are very good at doing things the same way every time and started automating a lot of these processes. We also began making more incremental code changes. Rather than waiting until a feature was entirely complete before releasing it to be test, tested, we made smaller incremental code changes. Smaller changes are easier to test, and we discovered they let us release value to the customer faster, and usually they have fewer bugs. And to establish that this code had fewer bugs, like any good developer, we got data. Starting in 2017, we started tracking how often we released our code, how many bugs we found, and some other specifics regarding this. But when you graphed it, we discovered there was a very obvious relationship between how often we released code and how many bugs we found. In 2017, we released code to production 28 times. The most days that it took us between code pushes was 56 days. We found 20 bugs in that release. Our buggiest release found 24 bugs. It had been 32 days since our previous code push. And if you look at the graph, you can see that the blue line of the days since our last push tracks the shape of the dotted orange line, which is the number of bugs found pretty closely. So we kept up tracking things in 2018. We got up to 47 code pushes that year. Our longest gap between pushes was 44 days, and that was the push where we found the most bugs. We found... We also made a specific effort to learn from our mistakes. When we originally set up code in GitHub, we did not set any safeguards on pushing code directly to our main branch, which meant that rather than submitting a pull request to merge code, you could push directly to that branch and overwrite everyone else's changes. That happened once, and we very quickly put in safeguards to make sure that those branches were locked down and could not be altered without a pull request in the future. Another mistake we had was when we started using toggles. Initially, QA would turn the toggles on so that they could see the newest code and they would begin testing it. Then they would turn the toggles to their expected production state and start testing the oldest code. The problem was this meant that code in its production state might not get tested before the next scheduled release. So we changed the order of things. Now the toggles were st started in their production state and the oldest code was tested first. And it was not until after this was called good that QA would begin testing the newer code. We also regularly reviewed what we were doing. The Agile retrospective process actually works very well for this. We could discuss the lessons that we had learned and changes that we wanted to make. The most important part of this, though, is to involve everyone who takes part in this process, the developers, the testers, and the DevOps team. And from this, you have to be willing to change your process, but not too many changes at once 
you want to actually be able to know what the result of that change was when you meet next. So, where are we now? We've got some well standardized and documented processes, not only for making code changes, but also for moving them across our environment. We've moved to a twice weekly deployment schedule. Generally, Tuesdays and Thursdays, mid morning, and taking full advantage of the fact that we can add an additional release date, or maybe move something to a different date, or cancel a deployment entirely, depending on what changes need to be made, if we need to coordinate with an outside partner, if there's a holiday, if a lot of people are out. In 2019, we deployed code to production 104 times. We celebrated with brunch in the office for our 100th deployment that year. In 2020, even with most of the year working from home, we got up to 108 deployments, but we didn't have brunch that year. Most of the time, we deploy Tuesdays and Thursdays mid-morning. And once the production code has been called good, QA will create a new test branch and update the test environment. We didn't log all of our deployments in 2019, but we did log from January through October. That took us to 90 code pushes in 10 months. And like in 2018, when we took the most time between pushes, we found the most bugs. So 20 days between pushes found 12 bugs. Just for comparison, in 2017, we had 28 pushes and found 24 bugs once in a single release. And in 2018, we had 47 pushes and had a max of 18 bugs found in a single release. We've really embraced using feature toggles. They're standard now for any new feature, as well as for any major enhancement or change to an existing feature. Our rule of thumb is that minor bug fixes and enhancements don't need a toggle, and something is considered minor if it's going to take less than a week from starting to code on it until finishing testing it. So, where are we going in the future? Well, we've still got that database. It's still very large. It's still not under source control. Data availability and consistency is absolutely paramount for our users. So we can't just start taking it into pieces. Our users still need to be able to access and update their existing data and add new data. We still need to have a good way of communicating changes. Have we added a new database? Have we added a table or a column? Do we just need to insert some new rows to our toggles? We'd like to move on to continuous deployment in other environments besides our dev environment. And that goes back to the database how do we automatically sync those changes when we add new tables or new columns to existing tables? This isn't such a problem with our dev environment because the developers will use the dev database when they are developing on their local machines. So that handles the database changes there, but those changes don't automatically sync. If we are continuously deploying code, do we need to change our toggle strategy for every bug fix? And what do we do if something goes so badly that we do have to roll back our code? And finally, besides moving to continuous deployment, we see the potential to use microservices at certain points in our code. 
Microservices are limited in scope. They would usually do only a single task per service. One thing we've talked about in particular is image handling. We have a lot of places in our system that need to handle image images. And if we had a microservice, it could be accessed globally. Loosely coupled to the rest of the system and independently deployable. So we could make changes to just that microservice. Anything that used it would be able to take advantage of those changes without the calling service itself needing to change. So I hope in all of this, you found this valuable. And it really is a process in learning how to make these changes, not only from the technical side, but also from the business side and showing that there is value in making a change of this magnitude. And collecting data can really help you in showing that yes, your customers will have a better experience if their code is more up to date and is in better state, fewer bugs, fewer issues whenever it's released. And it takes time, you have to iterate. So we're still in the middle of our uh, evolution of CI CD, but it's been a great improvement since we began. And we're hoping to go on to even better things in the future. I appreciate you all coming and listening. And thank you very much for your attention.